When you hear the word valued, what do you think of? Do you think of economic things like money? Or do you think about humanistic things like values? I'm a student of both applied economics and spirituality in business. If we are only thinking about it in economic ways and not in humanistic ways, then we can aim for profit and not purpose. If we only think about it in humanistic ways, without the ability to create value, we have said that it is isolated from the way in which we live most of our lives, which is at work. And what I want to do is blend the two together in this concept of onlyness. Each of us stands in a spot in the world only one stands in. Each of you stands in that spot in the world only you stand in. And from that place, your history, your experience, visions, hopes, even if they are imperfect, are perfectly yours. It says that each of us, distinctly ourselves, gets to add value. It's not saying you matter, it's saying each of us matter. All 7.5 billion of us have an opportunity to add our bit to the world. And yet, the data says that well over half, and likely as much as 70% of ideas from all of ourselves are not actually valued at work. And that's what I want to change and talk to you about today. I started this pursuit of this question a long, long time ago about how do you get heard at work? One of my first jobs was at Apple Computer. I was an admin, not even degreed, and at one point my boss had invited me to participate in some brainstorming meeting. I don't remember the topic at all, but I completely remember how I felt, how thrilled I was to be included in that moment. And so I did all the homework I could do and research and showed up to that meeting like just like ready. And no one made any eye contact with me whatsoever. I might as well have stayed in the parking lot because it was clear I really didn't need to be there. And I don't know if you guys have ever been in that kind of meeting where you start to wonder, was it something I could have done? One part of me sits there and thinks, maybe I should have raised my hand even higher. Or the other part of me wondered, hmm, maybe I was a little too eager in that golden retriever kind of way. One thing I observed, though, in that room was that the people who got heard, they had MBAs. And so I actually thought, well, that's it. All I need to do is get more education. And then I went on in my career getting an education, um, getting an MBA, in fact, uh, working all the way up to a corporate board level. So here I am as an admin at Apple. I've gone on and done things. I helped launch the first Apple web server. Uh, launched the first web authoring software, though, so I'm dating myself, right, a little in those stories. Um, but did all that so that I could have that sense that if there was a different table, then maybe I could get heard. And what I noticed, because I was in so many different rooms, is at any given time, there was only a select group who ever had a shot at their ideas being heard. Now, it often meant that people who are marginalized in society, maybe people who have autism or people of color, their ideas were marginalized too. But it wasn't just them. Young people were dismissed as inexperienced. Anyone have that one? Older people as out of touch. Anyone have that one? And so there was always a group of people that got heard and another group that were dismissed. And it wasn't that someone's ideas were sort of vetted and said, mm, that's not good. It was just out of hand. It's as if that person almost didn't exist. And the people who got heard were the one with the fanciest titles, even if their ideas were last year's reruns, or the loudest person at the table. People see that one a lot. And it wasn't until I found this research from um, Adam Galinsky and Joe McGee at Columbia University that helped explain this. They wrote that power and status act as self-reinforcing loops. It directly affects whether or not one's ideas are heard. Oof. So it means that if you have power, your ideas get heard with this sort of enthusiasm of, I totally see that. And then people will say, you know, and you can also go meet with these people to improve that idea and maybe 
Uh, you need a couple more thoughts here to ve develop it out. They'll sort of flush it out with you because all ideas show up as nascent ideas until they're developed. And the opposite is also true. If you don't have power, you get told, even if they use the same voice of, oh, uh-huh, they'll say something like, um, that's so original. And the tone suggests, actually, they didn't hear a word you said, right? Now, when I share the story about power and status affecting whether or not ideas are heard, sometimes I feel like I'm in a room ruining something really important for people. Like I've just sort of told you there's no Santa Claus. Because most of us believe in the meritocracy of ideas. That if we work hard enough, if we lean in to the situation, if we get better educated, if we learn how to be better communicators, if we have enough confidence, that somehow that idea will get heard. But all the data actually suggests something else. It's not that the idea is even being heard, it's that the person bringing that idea is quite often dismissed if they don't have power. And it's sort of, when I was doing this slide actually, my son was sitting next to me, he's 15 years old, and I said, oh, I wanna, I wanna think about how to say this thing because it's kind of a hard thing to say. And then I'm putting Santa Claus in the slide and then all of a sudden I look at him and I go, you still believe in Santa Claus, right? And he <laughs> rolls his eyes and he goes, like I believe in meritocracy. And, uh, <laughs> and the thing is, here's the, here's the reason why we like the idea of meritocracy. How many of you do, by the way? Can I get a show of hands? You all come to this conference, you don't believe in meritocracy. You're that savvy. You're just not willing to fess up. Or you saw the Santa Claus slide and now you know you're not supposed to believe in it. So the, the thing about meritocracy, the reason most of us still operate under that condition is because it's easier to believe and have this, that sense of control be ours than believe that the world is that unjust. To believe that we are somehow second-class citizens in the way that we work and the places we work hurts too much. And work perpetuates the idea because it keeps you working harder. And yet, when we acknowledge that there's no meritocracy, we can move on and acknowledge that those who are valued get to create value. And that is far too small a group, and that's what I want to work with you to change. Right now, the data says that about 30% of ideas are heard. Sometimes that's internal suppression of our own ideas, and sometimes it's external. Want me to do both of those? So you have the data behind it? The data says that 61% of us suppress our own ideas. And what we do, it's called covering. So we'll show up to work and we won't talk about our kids and we won't talk about, let's say, quilting, which I'm a quilter. We'll actually find ways to tune things down so that we fit in. What are we doing when we're fitting in? Are we expressing our originality? No. And by the way, that's not just traditional groups of, let's say, women or people of color. It is actually 45% of straight white men do it too. It's people who won't take their paternity leave because they're afraid it will look like they don't care about their careers to their colleagues. So that's the, that's the internalized suppression. Externally, we can start to measure it in a really simple way. Who already has power? And what do they look like? In the US, there's a group that is 31% of the US population. Not the majority, actually the minority. And that group though holds 80% of all elected seats and tells 95% of Hollywood's blockbuster stories. Crazy. And yet, of course, it's not that white men have like an absolute ticket to power, but we can use that number as a proxy to be able to say how big, who gets heard, who has a seat at the table, and how many of us, the vast majority of us, ideas are lost. That's a pretty big sizing. At Rotman University, I did some research a couple years ago and found that it adds up to over a trillion dollars of opportunity, a number so big that even when we published it, we're like, yeah, no one's gonna believe that. But we cut the data like six different ways. So when we can figure out how to get more ideas to the table, then those ideas can start to compete. So the thing that we have to understand is originality fuels innovation, it fuels progress, it fuels solutions. And yet many of us are seen by the lens of other instead of what only we bring to the table. So we're seen as different 
instead of distinctly ourselves. We're seeing through the subjective lens instead of the subject of our own story. We're seeing through the lens of otherness rather than onlyness. And the, the benefit to originality to our business is unquestionable, but we don't know how to see it in all the different powers of place that exist in our organizations. So right now we do two things in order to find a way for ideas to count. One is we try to figure out how to go up an org structure. So that's the hierarchical box, my drawing. You can see how well I draw. Or we figure out how to be part of the in-group in society because we know the in-group has a higher chance of being heard. So it's, it's women who wear shoulder pads. Really big ass shoulder pads. My boss at Autodesk was a CEO um, uh, at, and later went on to run Yahoo was Carol Bartz. And there was nothing about her that you could tell that she was um, feminine because she, she played golf. Uh, she did every single thing her male colleagues did. And the only thing that was different in the change state was that it was a woman doing those same things. And what she was just doing what, uh, is what most of us do is we figure out, okay, who has power? Okay, how do I act like that? And the third power of place is onlyness. But literally for millennia, it hasn't counted for much. So it was the Picassos, right, of the world, the artists. But in order for anyone to actually make a real living at something or be able to scale, they went and either figured out how to fit into an organization or conform to society. And that's the big thing that we're gonna talk about has changed. So what I've just described in what, 13 minutes? Big problem. Mostly depressing, kind of hard to solve, power. And yet there are things we can do to move it forward. I've been doing this research on onlyness now for seven years and I wanna walk away, I wanna at least share one major thing to walk away with and know that you can follow up and get more. The first I'm gonna start with is what not to do. And now you're gonna learn something about my personal life. So when I'm stressed out, I have this really bad habit of watching these law and order shows, like live streaming them, one after the other after the other. I think I like the closure and the sort of like resolution of it when my whole life is falling apart. And what I notice though is there's always the same scene where uh, Olivia Benson shows up to the house where the bad guys are and she knows she should wait for people and back up. But does she ever wait for backup? No. And I'm usually the one, I'm, I'm like the kind of person right then because it's super scary. I'm also like, I'll hide underneath the blanket and be like, don't go in there alone. And my husband's always like, but you know she's going to. So if you get nothing else from this story, it's that Olivia Benson should wait for backup and that you, in order to live out of your onlyness, should not think about it alone. There's research behind this that says if we're the only one in a room, three things happen that so negatively affect us we actually can't affect change. One is that we're watched, so we're super self-conscious. The second is that we're excluded from those social settings where relationships actually take place, where work happens. And the third is we feel tremendous pressure to assimilate to the existing group norms. And this is where you have to learn to be kind to yourself because we don't conform and give up on our originality because we want to, we do it because we have to, because human beings are social beings, because of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Belonging comes before being able to assert our own original ideas. And so the big thing that we often sell is this idea of just go do it. And actually it's counterintuitive, hence the law and order story, to not go in alone. If you wanna be your full whole self, you have to go figure out how to go in together. And that's why onlyness is not just a new way of saying, you be you. Tapping this power of onlyness is not about standing out in a crowd, it's about finding your crowd. And finding your crowd lets you do two things. It lets you incubate an original idea and also grow it so it can scale. A couple years back when I was first introducing the book and a woman stood up and said, she had just figured out how to help her husband do this really big thing, literally taking music to the moon. And she was waiting for him to help her with her big idea and she said, what can I change to figure out how to make that happen? And I told her, if the people around you 
keep shutting you down or ignoring your ideas altogether, don't change who you are, change who you're with. Now my husband got a little nervous when he heard this story. <laughs> but I wasn't suggesting that she get divorced. Instead, I was reminding her of this incredibly important research, that the people around us shape us. So you probably know the research, which says if, you, if the five people closest to you stop smoking, so will you. If they gain weight, so will you. If they lose weight, so will you. Ideas, they work the same way. Whenever we're in a setting where the people around us kind of poo-poo us, we can think it's us, and that same group can go, I totally see that, that's so original. I could see how you could make that work. I see why you care. Then all of a sudden we become more of ourselves. The second reason is about incubation. So I shared that slide where I said, you know, most of us figure out how to belong to organizations um, by either figuring out how to go up the hierarchy or figuring out how to get co-opted. The big shift today is we can now scale onlyness. You can now figure out what it is you care about and find the other people who care about it too, and thus have scale. But it means that you have to stand in that spot in the world only you stand in, and not allow the status quo, because that's what happens if you either go figure out how to conform to society or go fit into organizations. As nice as those people might be, the status quo is likely to squash or even suffocate your lovely new idea. And now you have to be able to stand in that spot and then figure out who else cares? Who cares about the same thing in this relational, social, human construct of onlyness so that this idea can now have a pipeline? This changes things from those who have existing power to ideas that are powerful. And the book, by the way, for those of you that haven't read it, is a series of 20 stories of people who have done that, research from 400. So, I want to just spend a minute now to talk about how do we take this home. For you as an individual, I want to talk about power itself. We often describe it as in he or she has power. Whether I or you have power. But that actually denies the other part of the equation. Power is not simply personal. It's profoundly social. And so as you stand in that spot in the world and find your purpose and what you care about, you can also seek and signal to find your people. And as you find your people, you end up joining together to be able to create change. The challenge is that most of us are so used to walking away from that spot in the world only we stand. We don't get immediate resonance, and so we go, gosh, maybe it's me, maybe I'm not wise enough or smart enough, and we think somehow we're not worthy, but instead to value that spot is to ask people to also join you in that spot. Organizationally, this says that if you want to build a culture of innovation, then we need to center on onlyness. That's what we haven't done so far. We've been figuring out how to put people inside our organizations instead of centering on that thing that is the source of all value creation. And that means that we stop asking the person who's not being heard to try harder. And instead, we create the social spaces that allows ideas to be heard so that people, including yourself, can contribute from that spot in the world only they stand. And that's how we create value, the human kind and the economic kind, through onlyness. Thank you.